The following is the second program in a special Word Pictures mini-series that is designed to bring a proper understanding to the doctrine of election, a doctrine that has often been neglected or cast aside in the modern church. And it's a doctrine that is often perceived as controversial simply because it's frequently prejudged and or misunderstood. In the first program, we laid a very important foundation. Specifically, we emphasize that it is scripture itself, not the commentaries of men, that actually introduces the idea of God's sovereign will and authority to elect or choose a peculiar people out of the rest to be his own. We began by pointing out how our human nature has a sinful tendency to believe only that which our heart desires, which then led us to the importance of gaining a true and correct understanding of the term election. So, as I've already mentioned, I like to define the words that we use right up front so that there's no confusion or debate over their meaning. And if I didn't know better, I would think that it would be almost unnecessary to define the terms elect or chosen because they seem like pretty self-explanatory terms. So, in order to understand this biblical term election, let me start by asking you a question that will hopefully help you to see that the biblical term elect isn't something we need to be afraid of or intimidated by. Here's the question. What do you do when you elect a mayor, for example? You select him out of a group of other candidates, correct? Well, that's all the term elect means in Scripture as well. It means that someone, in this case God, selects or makes a choice of one or more humans out of a greater number. Then with the use of three highly respected, historical, and very biblical sources, we were able to bring an even greater understanding of the term biblical election. Election is one, an act of God and not the result of the choice of the elect. Two, that this choice is made up of individuals from all nations and not a particular type of class or race of people, nor of a particular denomination. Three, that it was made without respect to the action of the persons elected. Four, by the good pleasure of God. Five, according to an eternal purpose that God had in mind. Six, it brings glory to God's grace without damaging the reputation of His justice. So join us now as we pick up where we left off with a wonderful verse from Deuteronomy 29, 29 that describes the best way for Christians to handle difficult doctrines like this awe-inspiring doctrine of God's sovereign election. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. In other words, it's important not to find ourselves speculating about carnal ideas and human philosophies to resolve the mysteries of Scripture and life that God has not explained, but without neglecting what He has explained. So we would do well to avoid carnal speculations like trying to explain the apparent contradiction in Scripture between God's sovereign will on the one hand and man's free will on the other, by using some fabricated story about two parallel lines that somehow mystically connect in heaven. And that is a common explanation that has crept into much of the modern church today on this issue, and it's popular because it seems to resolve the contradiction by using pacifying thoughts about how we'll all get the real answer about how God can be sovereign and elect without violating man's right to choose or reject God when we get to heaven. But for now, we're told, there's no real way to know for sure, which I suppose would be fine if that were true, if Scripture really hasn't revealed the truth on that matter. But it has. So it is our duty, not to mention highly in our best interest, to discover that truth. So the point is, we should avoid any idle speculations about God and the things of God. And yet, at the same time, it's our scriptural duty, our God-given obligation, 
to diligently seek to know everything that God has actually revealed in Holy Scripture so that we can know Him and, and love Him and serve Him better each day of our lives. And there are countless rich truths that have been revealed about the doctrine of sovereign election in God's Word that belong to us and our children forever. For too many Christians, it's far too common a practice to either blindly trust and follow everything they hear from the pulpit or to quickly and effortlessly write off apparent difficulties or paradoxes in Scripture as unknowable mysteries of the mind of God. But again, we need to realize that while God does not give us all of the answers, we can't ignore or neglect the answers that He does give. So, without going beyond what God says in Scripture about election, but without settling for less than what He says, let's go straight to the Word of God for the answers that we're all seeking. And let's look at six things that the Bible definitely teaches about God's sovereign election. The Bible, Holy Scripture states, one, that there is an election of men to salvation. Two, that this election is absolute. Three, that it is personal. Four, that it is from eternity. Five, that the elect were chosen in Christ. And six, that election is founded upon God's grace and mercy and not on man's own goodness or his own will in any way. And just in case there's any doubt that Scripture plainly states that men are elected to eternal life, let's read it with our own eyes. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. What Israel sought so earnestly it did not obtain, but the elect did. The others were hardened, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so they could not see and ears so they could not hear to this very day. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles? But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All that the Father gives me will come to me. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. 
for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. So that much is pretty self-evident, wouldn't you say? Scripture obviously states that God actually elects men to eternal life. And simply by reading those verses, any honest person would have to concede. You'd have to work pretty hard to avoid or misinterpret the plain meaning of those verses in order to deny that the Bible actually does teach the doctrine of election. Now, I understand that all of the ramifications of election are still somewhat open for debate at this point. But for starters, this much is clear. God does, in fact, choose some people in a special selective way out of the rest for some sort of special blessing. The next important point that Scripture plainly states about election is that it is absolute. And to say God's election is absolute simply means that it's set in stone. It can't be changed. Once it's determined, it's irrevocable. Because when God resolves to do something, Scripture says it gets done exactly the way he intended it to get done. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. But he stands alone, and who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I am not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days, I am He. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? So, as we've seen earlier, it is Scripture itself that teaches that God elects a person to eternal life. And now we see that it is Scripture itself that teaches that whenever God makes a decree that he is going to do something, that something always happens for certain. When God has made a decision, it is a decision that is sealed forever. Nothing can overturn it. Nothing can alter it. In fact, as a way of illustrating this point, you've heard the expression, the best laid plans of mice and men, right? Why do you suppose men use phrases like that? And why do you suppose all men can relate to them? Well, we use and relate to phrases like that because they refer to that well-known phenomenon that the best human plans are always subject to a thousand variables that ultimately are beyond our control. And so even our best plans and efforts and our best desires can be overruled by circumstances that we simply cannot predict or dictate. However, not so with God. His decisions are absolute. His will is final. He can predict all things because he can control all things. So when we as Christians use phrases from Scripture that speak of God's love for us before even the foundations of the world, it would be silly at best and contradictory to be sure to then turn around and also state that a genuine Christian could lose his or her salvation or that human free will could somehow 
override God's eternal decrees of election. And that someone that got elected could somehow then resist and reject his electing grace. If God doesn't control every event, he cannot control any event. Don't ever lose sight of that fact. And it will go a long way in keeping your theology in a lot of other areas on track. So, Scripture teaches election is absolute. In other words, when God elects, when Almighty God chooses, exactly what he wants to happen is exactly what actually does happen. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with His pleasure and will. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Sounds to me like God not only can elect men, but when he does, nothing can interfere and get in the way of his plans. Not Satan, not powers and principalities, not uncontrollable life circumstances, and certainly not the sinful, unregenerate, stubborn will of a human being. Uh, if God wants to bless a person with his sovereign grace, nothing will interfere with that. I think that's so plain, any honest person would have to agree. When God chooses, his choice happens exactly the way he wants it to. At the bottom line, the doctrine of election is a doctrine that states that God actually exercises his sovereign power and right to do with his own creation as he sees fit by choosing some people out of the rest of mankind and setting them apart for special undeserved blessing simply because it pleases him to do so. Now, of course, that's what makes this whole concept of God's sovereign election a bit more interesting because God's not just picking a shoot location or, or an apple out of a box. He's picking people for eternal life. So now the ante is suddenly raised quite a bit, isn't it? Now we enter into the realm of all of those doctrinal and life issues that tend to make people nervous around this subject. You know, nobody gets too concerned about God's sovereignty from a doctrinal standpoint when we're talking about the times in Scripture when he overruled, for example, inanimate nature, the wind or the the seeds, or when he showed his complete dominion over living animate creatures like animals. Nobody was overly concerned that the doctrine of God's sovereignty was somehow unfair when we were talking about animals being loaded onto Noah's ark. But now, suddenly, this is starting to get a little close to home. 
now as we discuss God's dominion over people, people who have minds and hearts and wills. Well, now it gets a bit more interesting, a bit more controversial, because let's face it, all kinds of questions come to mind. For example, if God sovereignly picks people for eternal life, well, how do you know if you and I are picked? And what if we're not? Is that fair? Does God really do that kind of thing? And if he does, what do we do? Do we just sit back and hope? And what about John 3:16? for God so loved the whole world? It sure doesn't sound very loving to pick some people for heaven and yet not others. Well, those are the questions and the issues that we'll deal with in this mini-series. But let me start off by setting straight a common misperception. As soon as some people hear that God does whatever pleases him, well, they immediately have a problem that to them is irreconcilable. And that's true because they're thinking of God's attributes in human terms. So they can't reconcile this concept that God can do whatever he wants to whoever he wants with the fact that God is also infinitely loving. Because for a being like God to do whatever pleases him, well, it sounds selfish. But here's one main point that we need to understand before we try to go too much further in this study of God's election. God can never be selfish, even when he does whatever pleases himself. At least not in the sense that it's a sin like it is for humans when they act in their own self-interest. Because when a human being puts him or herself first, they may or may not be acting in submission to the moral choice that is highest in value. But when God puts his own interests first, there is nothing or no one of higher value, nor is there any moral choice that could be higher. So God cannot be sinfully selfish, period. It would be impossible for him to do so, no matter what his choices are. As Elisha Coles once wrote, There is no unrighteousness with God. We must understand that truth. God can do nothing immoral. Scripture expressly states that, which is why the doctrine of his perfect righteousness proves to be an eternal blast to the vain and presumptuous confidence of unrepentant sinners, who, because vengeance is not speedily executed, have their hearts fully bent and set in them to do evil. Let them certainly know that he is able and willing to deal with them, and that his righteousness will, in the end, vindicate himself. He will by no means clear the guilty, and likewise, because there is no unrighteousness with God, his doctrines of sovereignty will be forever vindicated as holy and good and protected from all those senseless charges and allegations that he is somehow harsh, morose, or unjust in so declaring his sovereign will. In the final analysis, any and all objections that are brought against the doctrine of election's absoluteness, the fact that it saves some, though not all, and the emphasis on the fact that it is God who must move first and effectually transform the soul that he intends to save by free grace before that soul would choose to follow Christ would all be disbanded and sent to their own place if only this one truth, which none in words will ever dare deny, were truly believed and received in love, namely, that God has an absolute right of dominion over his creatures, to dispose and determine of them as seems good to him, and that in doing so, he cannot do anything but right. That's one reason why whenever God does whatever pleases him, it's always right and just and moral for him to do so. And when you add to that the fact that no human being deserves anything from God, unless of course you count the fact that we all unfortunately at the bottom line deserve hell, well, I'm not altogether sure why rational people feel it's possible to challenge the biblical doctrine that God sovereignly elects some, but not all, to eternal life, or why some challenge or try to dilute that truth down. Because all it's stating is what is stated in different ways throughout Holy Scripture, that God, by a, a beautiful, sovereign act of grace that 
that goes even beyond the common grace and invitation that he freely gives to all. Not only is loving enough to offer salvation to everyone, but in a super extraordinary display of grace, he even graciously elects some people for even more special blessing. That includes, but isn't limited to, ensuring and empowering their very salvation. A salvation that would not have happened otherwise. Because remember, these are people who were otherwise headed for eternal punishment in hell. Punishment that they deserved. Many people tend to lose sight of that fact. Men go to hell because of their own sinfulness. And despite the fact that God does invite everyone to come and freely accept salvation through Christ, well, men are so thoroughly wicked and self-centered that no one, says Scripture, seeks after God at all. So all that God is doing in election is granting some condemned, undeserving, stubborn sinners special favor and eternal life. He's merely having mercy on whomever he desires to have mercy, just like he says he will in Romans chapter 9. And keep in mind, it not only makes perfect sense that a sovereign God would have the authority and the right to give undeserved mercy to whomever he wants, but it leaves no one out who really wants salvation through Jesus Christ. And with the time that we have left in this program, let me show you one last point about this awe-inspiring doctrine that's pretty hard to honestly debate, at least if you take your position straight from the Bible. Scripture plainly states that election is personal. And when the Bible refers to a personal election, it's talking about a special, distinguishing love for particular individuals. And this love is not referring to the love that God by nature has in general for the whole world. God is loving to all, even towards his enemies. But this love refers to his special love for his children, children who have been made up of some smaller group of people selected out of the whole world. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. So when the Bible uses terms like elect or chosen, it's clearly communicating that it was not the whole lump of mankind that was the object of God's election. Nor was election, as some people like to say, a decree made by God after he somehow peered into the future and then chose those who would choose him. Which, if we're being honest, really just amounts to about the same thing, because if God only chooses someone due to the fact that they were going to choose him anyway, well, then that renders the whole act of election by God virtually unnecessary and worthless. And Scripture would hardly spend so much time on a subject that amounts to virtually nothing, much less give it its own name, election, to describe it. Now, election according to the Bible is the sovereign act of God where certain predetermined people were individually and specially chosen by name 
They were singled out personally from the rest and ordained to eternal life. Jesus calls them in John chapter 17, quote, men that were given to him by the Father out of the world, end quote. And they are not only a predetermined number, but they were predestined by name for this special grace and favor from God. And by those names, he knows them. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me a holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone like a jasper, clear as crystal. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lord knows those who are His. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, He has made mention of my name. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. They will be my people, and I will be their God for they will return to me with all their heart. Frankly, I find that comforting, that God knew my name before all of time, and that he's always loved me in a special, personal way. In fact, the only ones who would find that troubling is unbelievers, and I suppose they should. But to them, even to them, I would say, if it is a concern to you, if you're somehow afraid that you may not be one of God's elect children, well then go to God, beg Him for mercy, and by faith make the promises of the gospel your own and your very desire to do so, coupled with your action in doing it, will become the evidence and assurance to your own soul that you also are personally one of His. Or your lack of desire to do so, coupled with your inaction, will become the evidence and assurance to your own soul that you may not be personally one of his elect children at all. Oh, but to believers, to believers, God's special personal love for you should be one of the dearest and most prized possessions that you could ever carry in your heart because it speaks of the fact that God made you personally exactly the way you are in order that he may lavish his amazing love on you for all of eternity and so that you may love him in the same way now, nothing could be a greater blessing nothing could ever bring that kind of comfort and consolation in the storms of life Election is from eternity. Scripture teaches us that the election of God's elect was an issue that was decided long before the world was even made. So the Bible, as we're about to see momentarily, teaches that if you are God's saved child now, or if you ever will be, 
is only because he has had a special love for you from before time began. He always has, and he always will. It's one of the most precious, intimate truths that the Bible expresses to his children. In fact, here, let's look at it in Holy Scripture. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. I in them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. Now, all I want you to do with those verses is to stop and think about them. Think about what you just heard. Because what those verses, and many more like them, teach the child of God is that the all-powerful creator of the universe has had a deep, intimate, and eternal love for you personally since before the beginning of time. Now, I have to ask you, seriously, does it get any better than that for the child of God? Shouldn't that just make your heart sing? As Martin Luther once put it, Lord, strike me with affliction as thou wilt, as thou sees fit, because you have chosen me, pardoned and forgiven me in all of my sins from before time began. So strike me if thou wilt, and I will nonetheless sing. Oh, those words are so true. And how I wish I could inject into your soul that truth about God's sovereign election. Because there's not an affliction or a problem or a difficulty that can overtake us. We only get hold of just what it really means to be elected or chosen by Almighty God. If only our souls grasp the, the true depths of our sin and the magnificent heights of having been delivered and saved by God's electing grace. Well, joy and contentment would be our constant companion. Oh, far from a biblical doctrine to be feared and avoided, this doctrine of election is to be cherished and loved and pursued. Scripture makes another flat and direct statement about election. It plainly states that the elect were chosen in Christ. In other words, election and all its privileges and all of its benefits come from, in, and through Christ. And those things come in no other way. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, 
for God's wrath remains on him. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will. So here's the point. The Bible is chock full of promised blessings. But the vast majority of those blessings, and really all eternal blessings, the ones that have to do with heaven, are exclusive to God's elect, his chosen people. Nobody else has the privilege of enjoying the benefits that they bring. All are invited to come freely to Christ, and all who do come will be readily and gladly accepted. But Scripture teaches with no equivocation whatsoever that the only ones who will benefit from those blessings in the end will be those whom God himself has elected from before the creation of the earth. What those verses that you just saw with your own eyes also tell us is that 100% of those blessings for the elect must come through Jesus Christ. They don't come through Christ. If the elect are not found in Christ, we would receive none of those blessings. It is for his sake that God is willing to treat us with such overwhelming and lavish love. That is what the Bible teaches. It teaches that it is only, quote, in him, in Jesus Christ, that the Father is well pleased, end quote. So that is the only way a good and pure and holy God can look on at sinful human beings and be well pleased. It is only when we are in Christ that such a thing could happen. Now, we may think we look fine morally when we compare ourselves to other people. We may think that we're quite lovable and quite worthy of being saved. But in God's eyes, the only way we can even be found to be acceptable is when he sees us in and through what his son has done in dying on the cross to save and purify us. And therefore, outside of Jesus Christ, there is nothing pleasing to God or eternally good for or from men, at least according to Holy Scripture and the judgment of God anyway. And I say that because men often consider themselves, while not perfect, at least acceptable to God. And even some Christians speak of having chosen Christ or having made a decision to follow Christ, not so much with a humble heart of surrender, but more as though they somehow were responsible for finally coming to their senses and, and picking him out of their own wisdom and goodness. In fact, even a, a well-known evangelical Bible teacher and preacher recently expressed those exact same kinds of sentiments in a book that was just released only about a month or two prior to the production of this very program. Here, listen for yourself. This is an actual excerpt from that book. Praise God, I've been saved from hell and I'm going to heaven. I've made the choice. God doesn't technically send anyone to hell. A person only goes to hell by his or her own free choice. Make no mistake about it. Heaven is a home populated by the Lord and his loved ones who have made the deliberate choice to be there. But there will also be those who will be outside by their own choice. But scripture, scripture makes no bones about declaring otherwise. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. 
The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? That's a pretty grim picture of natural, unregenerate man. With a heart like that, it's not hard to see why no man seeks after God of his own volition. And that is why Scripture says we need to be chosen in Christ, called in Christ, created in Christ, and preserved in Christ. Because apart from Christ, getting in there and powerfully and effectually intervening on our behalf, apart from Christ's work on the cross that paid our debt for us, all of our best efforts, all of our good works, all of our acts of so-called morality and love, and yes, even all of our acts of so-called faith are nothing but filthy rags in God's sight. Men may think highly of their own good deeds and their own overtures towards God, and they may think highly of the good deeds and faith of other men, but God knows the true motives of all men apart from Christ. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. He knows men's true hearts, even if they happen to be self-deluded about those things. Which is why our election, our, our very salvation, must also come in and through Christ, and why it can come in no other way. In fact, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 says, every spiritual blessing we have as Christians are in Christ. And if those blessings didn't come in and through Christ, we'd either never be able to have them or we'd never be able to keep them. So I, for one, am glad that my salvation wasn't left up to me. I'm glad God moved first and jumped in and changed my nature so that my will could choose him freely because the results clearly would have been very different otherwise. When I say different, I mean obviously worse, not better. I never would have selected Jesus Christ because prior to him lovingly intervening in my life and converting my soul and, and giving me the eyes to see, I would have freely chose our right, I would have freely chose the sin that I so loved and rejected the blessed Savior that I so needed. Oh, as Charles Spurgeon once put it, God is jealous of his own honor. He will not allow his church to be even delivered in such a way that would honor men rather than God. I warn thee, thou canst never save thyself. If thou try and contribute one part or all, thou strength will be unsuccessful. Thou canst never regenerate thine own soul. Thou canst never cause thyself to be born again. And though the new birth be absolutely necessary to see heaven, it is absolutely impossible to thee unless God the Spirit shall do it, and do it all. He will take to himself the throne without a rival. He will only wear the crown that no other head has worn. For as truly as he is God, the earth shall know that it is he and he alone that delivers a man unto salvation. To him be the glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. If you or I were left to our own wills, to our own hearts, to our own inclinations, to even so much as choose Christ in order to be then regenerated, well, Scripture is clear about what the outcome would be. Our natural wills, like all humans, would not seek after God. Scripture teaches that our natural hearts, like all humans, are wicked and deceitful. 
And scripture is also clear about every last single one of our inclinations. Genesis chapter 6 and chapter 8 teach that all, not just some, not just most, but all of the inclinations of the hearts of man, apart from being regenerated by Jesus Christ, are evil all of the time. Which clearly means that unregenerate men naturally reject even the blessings and the free gifts of God. Even his free offer of salvation would be rejected if Christ didn't intervene directly in the hearts of those whom the Father has given him. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Because every inclination of the natural human heart is evil all of the time, according to Scripture. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Ephesians chapter 2 teaches that unregenerate man is spiritually dead. And dead men obviously can't choose anything. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2 also teaches that spiritual things, when presented to an unregenerate natural mind, are just foolishness to it. Natural men consider spiritual truths, and especially the gospel, absolute nonsense. Which, when you take those verses collectively with the rest of what Scripture teaches about the utter depravity of the human heart, well, it clearly means that unregenerate men will always naturally reject even the blessings and the free gifts of God. Even his free offer of salvation would be rejected if Christ didn't intervene directly in the hearts of those whom the Father has given him. Because every inclination of the natural human heart is evil all of the time. That's what Scripture says. We must choose Christ, don't get me wrong, but when we do, it is evidence that we are born again. It does not create the new birth within us, and that is what Scripture definitively declares. So not only do I not consider it a violation of my free will that all of my blessings must come through my sovereign election in Christ, but frankly, I'm thrilled that they come at all, because without Christ's infallible work on the cross and the Father's absolute decree to save us before time began, Without the Holy Spirit's blessed, effectual work in my life, making it all come alive in my heart, my salvation never would have happened. And that, whether some men choose to accept it or not, is true of all men. Join us next time for the continuation of these six truths found in Holy Scripture regarding this God-honoring doctrine of election.